afternoon. Welcome to the Commemorative Air Force Dixie Wing in Peachtree City, Georgia. My name is Chris Madrid. I am proud today to kick off the first Living Aviation History program at Falcon Field. Today we're going to have a Stearman panel discussion with several members of the organization who are restoring from the ground up a historic uh, Stearman aircraft. Uh, a little information about the Commemorative Air Force. Uh, if you don't know, we're the oldest and largest World War II flying museum in the world. We were founded in 1957 and today we have 11,000 members across the world. We have 160 aircraft that we maintain and fly through the 100% volunteer effort of all our members. Uh, Dixie Wing based here in Peachtree City. We have seven operational World War II aircraft. We've restored three of those. And today we're gonna talk about our latest project, the Stearman. For those of you who don't know, the Stearman is one of the most iconic trainers of the 1930s and 1940s and it's also a tribute to the men and women who built the aircraft. Uh, over, throughout the day, you're gonna learn about this project, about the men and women who are making it possible. And if you want more information, don't forget to go to cafsteerman.com. Uh, finally, follow us on Facebook after this broadcast. The information will be available. And uh, now I'll talk about the four different segments that we're going to share. Uh, first of all, Robin Rogan's week, we'll talk about the Stearman and Rosie the Riveter. And then Jeff Clark, one of our members who's actually leading this project, is gonna talk about the history of the type, as well as an overview of the restoration. Vic Syracuse, uh, one of our friends in the aviation community, he'll share with us his journey with the Stearman, his love affair. And then finally, we're gonna share with you a pretty uh, exciting moment where one of our members, Robin, is gonna take her first flight in the Stearman today. So Jeff, um, Robin, Vic, thank you very much. And Robin, Tell us how you got connected to this project and more importantly, why you became a member of the Commemorative Air Force. I became a member of the Commemorative Air Force. Well, I went to an event at PDK several years ago and um, I've actually found them online and I volunteered. And the reason I got offered to volunteer is because my grandfather was a B-17 pilot. And so I have a very much um, a deep affection for World War II. I'm very proud of my grandfather, his 35 missions, which he did complete um, successfully and came home. And so it was just, it's just a very passionate personal connection, the aircraft and all the people I've met and everything. I really enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. And being able to do this one is exciting because I've always wanted, I like cars, so I like mechanical things. So being able to put my hands on an airplane is really cool. I think this is going to be a lot of fun and just, I think it's going to be a great project. So really it, it started with the family connection, yes, but definitely. tell me about the historic connection of this project. Um, well, we decided, one of the members, she came up with the idea of uh, kind of getting women involved to do an aircraft, um, work on one of the aircraft, and so when we found out we were got a steerman, uh, she brought the idea uh, up to somebody here, and it kind of kicked off the whole Rosie the Riveter thing, because we knew, well, who better than to have a project for, or in honor of, is Rosie the Riveter, and so we are trying to we've got six females we've got six female members um, who are going to help us do the Rosie the Riveter project and we just think it's a great idea to honor her and she is also finally we've gotten um, national recognition for Rosie the Riveter finally and uh, so it's, I think she's shipyards, um, making ammunition, uh, taking jobs that ne never had had before and previously had been held by men uh, who had to go off to war. And so this put women into the workforce and really started women getting into the workforce and getting involved and they were nicknamed Rosie the Riveter. Um, the first uh, Rosie the Riveter was, uh, the song came out first in uh, 1942 I believe. Um, and her name was, well, it was Rosalind something or another, I can't remember her last name, but anyway, the song came out and then the poster for Westinghouse, this was an internal picture for Westinghouse Electric, this was done as um, an incentive poster. Uh, it came out in, I think before actually, because I looked up Rockwell's picture, it came out in 43. So Rockwell, Rosie the River came out in 43. But she is the representative of all the women who put in the absolute effort to get us to be the arsenal of democracy for World War II. That's a great history lesson, and one of the most important lessons kids in the 
kindergarten through fifth grade learn in the course of their education, especially here in Georgia. And so beyond the Rosie story, um, there's a great history behind the aircraft itself. And Jeff Clark actually owns the Stearman as well as Vic Syracuse. And Jeff, what can you tell us about the aircraft? But more importantly, tell me how you got connected with this project. Well, uh, originally I'm from uh, central Illinois and uh, a little middle of the nowhere place between Chicago and Peoria farming community. And not too far from there, there's a little town called Galesburg. And uh, when I was 10 years old, my grandfather took me to the Galesburg Stearman Fly-In, which even today is still an active event. And you know, every year they get over 100 Stearmans flying into that place. And me as a 10 year old boy <laughs> seeing this, I'm like, wow, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. And uh, you know, my grandfather actually also had a Stearman connection as well. He was a, he was a Marine in World War II. He didn't fly in World War II, but he got his pilot's license um, afterwards with the GI Bill. And he actually uh, flew Stearman crop dusters. So he was going to see the crop testers, I was just going to tag along, but I thought it was really neat. And uh, in 2007, I actually had bought a Stearman, more or less learned to fly the Stearman, and took it back to Galesburg to kind of complete that full circle. And uh, you know, I bought and sold probably a half dozen different airplanes over the years, and a lot of times it's kind of like what they say about boats, you know, the happiest day is when you buy it and when you sell it. <laughs> when I sold that Stearman, I really missed it. And uh, a couple years ago, I had an opportunity to get another one. and. Uh, yeah, for some reason I just uh, really like them and uh, I have to say they're pretty much my favorite airplane. In the history of the aircraft, uh, tell us a little bit about the origins and how long they served. Well, uh, you know, the interesting thing about a Stearman is everybody calls it a Stearman. It's not a Stearman, it's actually a, a Boeing. Um, the reason that it's called a Stearman is because it has its roots with a guy named Lloyd Stearman who, uh, you know, started early days of aviation. He actually started a, a company called the, the Travel Air Aircraft Company. Um, he started with Lloyd's, Lloyd Stearman, Clyde Cessna, and uh, Walter Beach, kind of famous names in aviation. They all started this company and started making a, a two-place, two-passenger, two one-pilot uh, biplane that was uh, you know, pretty popular in the day. And uh, they, Stearman eventually went off and did his own thing. Obviously, all three of them, since they're such uh, common names in, uh, in aviation, went off and did their own thing. But, uh, you know, Stearman started making mail planes. He had a, a few successful mail biplane designs. And uh, he, on speculation, decided to try to sell a trainer to the military. And he designed a, a Stearman called the, the Model 6. Tried to So, but Boeing and Stearman ended up as part of the same company. And some of the engineers from the original Stearman group got together and said, hey, let's, let's try this trainer thing. We see what's going on in Europe. We think there might be a market for this. We're gonna need to start training some pilots pretty soon. And they took that old Lloyd Stearman Model 6 design and re refined it a little bit and ultimately came out with the Model 70 and tried to sell it. And the military said, you know, it's still too easy to fly. You guys gotta make this thing a little bit challenging so it trains our pilots to go fly these fighters. So they uh, basically got something the military liked um, with the Model 75, and the Boeing 75 is what we all know as, as a Stearman. And uh, did the uh, Army use it, Navy use it? Oh yeah, um, they all used it. Um, they, they built about 8,500 airframes and about another 2,000 airframes in parts, so about 10,000 airframes total. Um, you know, it was used kind of through the uh, mid to late 30s all up until the end of World War II. Um, Honestly, it was a bit of an obsolete design in World War II. You know, I 
there weren't many biplanes that were flying in World War II. So uh, after World War II, they basically surplused all of them. And uh, you had all of these pilots that were leaving the service, and you had all these airplanes that were leaving the service, and some of these pilots, some of the more uh, entrepreneurial ones, decided, you know, hey, I've got 500 bucks, I'm going to go buy a Stearman. I've got another 500 bucks, I'm going to go buy a BT-13. I'm going to take that Pratt & Whitney 985 off the BT-13 and put it on the Stearman, and, you know, for a thousand bucks, I'm in the crop dusting business. So, and really that crop dusting business is what kept the Stearman alive because, um, you know, you, you had this whole cottage industry kind of get built up around the Stearman. You've got like uh, dusters and sprayers and uh, Mid-Continent were all these companies that basically remanufactured and supported and, you know, had all the parts available to keep the Stearmans flying throughout up until the 70s and maybe even early 80s when they were flying as crop dusters. And when the crop dusting industry started to pivot to heavier turbine airplanes, um, people started to look at these Stearmans and say, you know, these are nostalgic World War II airplanes. And they started converting them back from crop dusters into examples like the one we see today. Well, a couple things, some of the fans of aircraft, though, they're curious about the difference. You have a Stearman, you have a PT-17, you have an N2S, and you have k -Dip. What is the difference between those? Well, in actuality, there's not a lot of difference. I think a lot of the difference is, uh, you know, the, the Army airplanes were called the PT-17. Um, or, you know, PT-13, PT-18, depending on what engine it had on there, but the airframe was basically the same. Um, the Navy airplanes were generally called the N-2S. Um, they even sold a few to Canada that they called the PT-27. Um, Canada didn't like open cockpit biplanes very much, though. It was a little chilly in the north for that. Um, so it wasn't super successful up there. But they did introduce the KDET moniker. So honestly, I'm not sure what KDET means or you know, what it stands for, but I know it came from the Canadians and uh, it seemed to uh, seemed to kind of proliferate as a general moniker for the whole line. You know where KDET came from? I think it was just a little bit of a twist on cadet. On cadet, yeah. French, French for cadet, today. probably. French for cadet? I guess. Well, before we talk about the restoration of Jane and Robin, a couple of questions for you, so for both of you. What interests you about this project, and what's your family connection to World War II aviation? Sure, sure. Uh, my name is Jane, and uh, I actually do have a World War II connection. My Mary was a young girl growing up in Greenville, Tennessee, and she was hanging around airports, got her license when she was uh, 16, but and the war broke out for the Americans to get involved, and she was too young to join the WASP, the Women's Air Service. So what she did is she went off and became a Top Gun instructor for the Navy at age 17. And I, as a little girl growing up, I knew I loved airplanes, but I didn't know why. Mm -hmm. And I finally met my Aunt Mary. I know it sounds crazy, but I didn't meet her until I was 17. And that's when I fell in love with it. And just like Robin, I was at an air show and they said, hey, we need volunteers mm -hmm. at the Dixie Wing. So here I am, I love mm -hmm. it. Great thing, great story, Robin. What's uh, your story? Hi. I'm Robin O'Reilly, and I've been a member with the CAF for about 10 years. Um, my family history is my grandfather and some aunts and uncles actually lived in Oak Ridge, Tennessee in the 40s and were working on the Adam Bond, unbeknownst to them. I came to a veteran event here one year, and I was so impressed with the organization. And I have to tell you, when they crank these planes <laughs> up, it just gives you a chill and you are you're so proud to be an American and we're so proud of our military and the the arsenal power that we have and mostly as a tribute to the veterans who sacrificed so much uh, for all of us and we like to continue to recognize them thank you brother very nice so, Jeff a little bit about the restoration well uh, it's going to be a really good project for the Dixie Wing. We actually have two separate airframes uh, that were acquired from separate sources. And uh, both of them are, they need a lot of attention. Um, in fact, if you want, we can kind of walk through and show you some of the people you got. Yes. Well, Stearman's interesting because it's an airframe that's actually kind of a hybrid. As you can see here in this horizontal stabilizer piece, this is all metal. Um, a lot of the airframe is actually metal. But some of the most important parts, as you can see right over here in this wing, it's wood. And if you look at some of this woodwork, it's beautiful. It's almost furniture, furniture quality. And all of the wood and the metal is ultimately covered by fabric to look like uh, big Stearman behind us. But uh, as you can see, it needs a lot of attention. Um, this horizontal stabilizer here 
it's in pretty good condition, but there are some places where it's dented and corroded and it's gonna need a little bit of repair. But ultimately what we're going to do is sandblast all of this, fix the parts that need fixed, and we'll put on an epoxy primer and basically cover it with the fabric. And uh, the fabric covering process is really interesting. You basically glue the fabric down, um, use some chemicals to basically shrink the fabric and uh, stitch the fabric to the wings, to the ribs, and that will hold it down real tightly and uh, form a nice taut surface um, for the airflow. Um, but there's a lot of that we've got to do. The horizontal stabilizer, vertical stabilizer, all the flight controls, four wings, center section. It's, it's a big job. Um, behind the wing here, you can see the actual fuselage. The fuselage is tube steel. And, uh, you know, if, if I'm going to crash an airplane, I want to crash an airplane that's a steerman because you're basically in this cage so that the pilot's actually fairly well protected. Um, and uh, it's, it's a very strong airframe, which was important because it was a trainer. Uh, some people might be curious why this hybrid construction, why steel and wood? Well, there was a lot of demand for, for metals and uh, some of the, the steel materials in World War II, and uh, wood was plentiful, so areas where wood made sense, they would use it. You can actually see that control stick over there. It looks kind of like a baseball bat. Um, some of the Stearmans had metal control sticks. Uh, this one has wood. Wood was to the ears of the person in back. It's not, it's a purely acoustic thing. It's not electronic at all. And he would yell into this funnel and the person could hear him through his uh, little earphones there. There's no way to, to talk back. So the instructor could look up and see the student in the mirror and the student could give a thumbs up or the student could give a, I don't know what the heck you're talking about. And that was the mechanism that they would communicate through the flight instruction process. Um, so lots of neat little stuff, um, lots of instruments here. A lot of the instruments that we have with the project are gonna need to be restored. Uh, these are the types of compasses that we had that obviously that compass needs a little bit of attention. So as we go through the restoration process, um, lots of pieces need the TLC, but we hope when we go through it, it will almost look as good as fixed. <laughs> um, there's going to be a fair amount of money required for that. Um, so we don't know exactly how much it's going to cost yet, but the, the stuff that we have totaled up that we know we need to buy it's getting very close to $100,000. And that doesn't count the stuff we don't know we need to buy yet. So uh, it wouldn't surprise me if this approaches the $150,000 total restoration budget. Well, in this, um, this project, we're very much in the tradition of the Dixie Wing. The, air, the organization has restored three different aircraft over the last 15, 20 years. And it's 100% volunteer effort where um, all the volunteers learn together, they work together, and uh, they're led by experienced AMPs who really create a first class restoration. Uh, Vic, um, for your thoughts, is, um, we're at the point, Jeff, where I think we're almost ready for the aircraft walk around. Um, What's your connection with the steamer? So, uh, I've been flying since 1977. I went down to the Aero Club at Davis Mountain Air Force Base and learned to fly. Okay. And ever since then, I've flown about 72 different kinds of airplanes, almost 10,000 hours. I've never seen more smiles on faces. <laughs> in any other airplane than I get to see in a Stearman. And, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I have flown Stearman since, uh, I don't know, 1997 or so, and uh, probably taken 500 rides in Stearmans. I never charged a dime, and I've had five or six kids now come back and tell me they've got their license. And their first ride was in the Stearman. And like Jeff mentioned, him getting excited and incentivized to go flying because he was this 10 year old boy at Galesburg <laughs> seeing somebody. <Steerman> Central. <laughs> exactly. I mean, if you haven't, for those of you out there, if you haven't heard of Galesburg, you need to go Google it and look out there. I was there last year for the flight, and unfortunately, things got canceled this year. Next year's the 50th anniversary. I have to tell you, in all the years of flying, it's the most fun I've had with people or airplanes. No vendors, and it's like taking a walk back in time. We had 82, I think, airplanes there last year at Galesburg, and all day long it was like being at a World War II Army training field, from what I can imagine. But all day long, two ships, three ships, airplanes doing takeoff and landings, there was nothing but radial noise. I think somebody mentioned how neat it is to hear these engines um, fire up. And, and just like you in Galesburg, Jeff, uh, the president of the Stearman Restorers Association, now Mike Rutledge, uh, he actually grew up in Galesburg. And, and he tells the story about being 10 years old and on Saturday coming out on his mom's porch and see the, 
Stearman saw flying over. He's now a retired Navy SEAL and he's the president of the Stearman's Association. <laughs> so it's just, it's one of those airplanes that, uh, you know, all those people I've taken for rides, some of them, much like anybody who's taken their first airplane ride, they have some trepidation. Uh, I have yet to see anybody not smile in this mirror about the time <laughs> it breaks ground. And, and that's what I'm watching all the time because you can actually see you know how how that person feels. It's probably a different view than the, the than in the army training period when somebody was trying to either uh, you know learn how to fly the steerman or end up in the infantry. Okay, but it's just it's just a fun airplane that that is just you know people enjoy it. The other side of it is one of the things. So we can hear. The other thing I really enjoy the most of with the steerman is meeting all of the veterans learn to fly in the Stearman because I don't know what the actual statistic is. My guess is it's over 80% of pilots in World War II actually learned in the Stearman before they went on to T-6s or fighters or bombers or something. But meeting those people and taking them flying and listening to the stories that they have to tell. There's a group of us every year we go down to Pensacola for the Blue Angels show which we fly in and for two days prior, we take a number of veterans flying. And, and to see that group of people, most of them are you know, mid-90s now, and unfortunately from one year to the next, some aren't, aren't there anymore. But uh, I'm gonna share one story that was just, uh, out of all the stories that, that I've heard down there, they were loading this gentleman in my uh, steerman for one of the flights. And uh, once we got all connected up and everything, I got the engine started, you know, we kind of start chatting and, I asked what his connection was to the Stearman, and he told me he'd never actually been in an airplane. But he was the first person decorated in World War II for firing a shot in anger. Turns out he was on the deck of the Hurlburt in Pearl Harbor, and had come up for a smoke. He was a Navy seaman. And uh, he saw this Japanese torpedo bomber go by, and he said, that didn't look right. And uh, he grabbed a deck gun and started firing on that Japanese torpedo bomber. And so he was awarded a medal. So here we are in a flight of four. We would go out over the beach and fly prior to the Blue Angels show. And uh, he's having a great time from what I can tell. Uh, he's 93 years old. So we land, we taxi back in, and the propeller comes to a stop. And there's about three generations of his family there. And first things you hear, how was it, Dad? How was it, Gramp? No. And from the front seat, I hear, that was the best thing I've done in my entire life. He says, but next year, I'm bringing binoculars so I can see the girls on the beach better. <laughs> <laughs> I was so proud of him. <laughs> you know, it's a great story. Anyway, it was just, it's a, it's a fun airplane. You know, it's just, it's just a great airplane to share with everybody. Well, Jeff and Baker, a question for you. So, uh, there are about a thousand of these planes flying today give or take. There are 500 aviation museums across the nation, and a lot of people share this passion to restore and preserve history. How important is it for us to work with other like organizations and share our work with them? So as I tell everybody, uh, first off, I think that's a wonderful question, because one of the things I think about all the time uh, with these spearmans and some of the other workers around here is that uh, I try to remind everybody, we really are just caretakers for the next generation. And it's really on our shoulders to inspire the next generation, much like Jeff and others. But, you know, at 10 years old, saw an airplane, and maybe it, it just got something going in their heart and a passion for it. I think if we don't do that, these things are going to become museum pieces. And you're not going to see too many happy faces in a museum. It would really, really be sad to not inspire the next generation of Mars astronauts uh, by us not, you know, doing what we should be doing by sharing. At least that's my two cents on Yeah, and uh, completely brick construction, you know, that's becoming a lost art. And, you know, by, by uh, working with these groups and cooperating and sharing that knowledge and keeping it alive, it will just help keep it going and uh, hopefully spark the interest that, that they talk about. Robin, Jane, and Robin, what do you think about working with other organizations? Oh, I think it's fantastic. I have been able to make good contact with the National American Rosie the Riveter Association. They have been just spot on on helping helping me get the word out there and everything. And I think um, what I like about it is, is from an educational standpoint is, is getting, I'd like young girls in schools. That's a good STEM and STEAM thing to get girls involved in aviation. Um, this is a good place to start. This is super basic and uh, which is good for me because I don't know anything. 
but I think it's just, I think the connection's fantastic, and I'm hoping to branch out to more um, groups that have women, inspiring women to get involved with us, join the Dixie Wing, and get involved with the, uh, working on the aircraft. I think it'd be a lot of fun. I think it'd be good. Jane, what about you? Well, uh, my former life, I was working at the University of West Georgia, and so I pretty much have to say what, what Robin said, and education is so important, and so important for our young women, mm -hmm. and I, I just, I, I see this as such a wonderful educational experience, and also to get young girls excited about getting in the STEMs. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I agree. I agree with Robin on that. 100%. Robin O'Reilly. Yeah. Well, they say that uh, we're going to have a, a pilot shortage in our future. So, what better way than now to start, especially our girls, into the aviation and the science and engineering field, so that they feel the role of pilots today and in the future. Great, thank you. And uh, Vic, I think it's time for our walk around. Okay. All right. So let's take a look at the airplane then. Basically from a overall picture when you walk up to the airplane, it's important to make certain there's no leaking fluids. So there's a few places you wanna look. It would be underneath the main wheels. There is fluid both in the brake system and in the hydraulic oleo struts. So it's, you know, quick glance underneath those, make sure there are no leaks. And then walk around the airplane, as Jeff and others have mentioned, it is a fabric airplane. So it's important there aren't any holes in it, okay? Uh, you wanna check for movement. I think we've got the controls locked on this one, but you would check that these are the ailerons for up and down movement. Make sure it goes back and forth to the stops. I take a look at the flying wires. Okay, these are actually landing wires and then flying wires. Make sure they are broken, you would see that, but the jam nuts actually are tight at each end. These are called the broomsticks or the javelins. Make certain they are tight against the flying wires. You'll see when we go around to the other side, I'll usually just grab those and make certain that they're, they're tight. I'll just do a casual glance down the fuselage and make sure there are no streaming fluids from the engine. Yes, they're radial engines and they leak. Uh, but we try and make them so they don't leak too much, okay? And certainly anything that would be streaming down the fuselage would be a, uh, you'd want to look at it, okay? Most likely oil, either from the propeller governor, from the propeller control mechanism, or from the oil lubrication system. Okay. With that, we'll come around to the rear side. Tail wheels, extremely important on a tail wheel aircraft. Okay, so you want to pay attention down there. I'll usually grab the airplane and rock it back and forth and make sure and everything in there is tight. You don't hear any clicking. We do have flying wires on the horizontal stabilizer here and the vertical stabilizer. Just want to kind of tap those. Same thing on the bottom here. Okay, one on each side. Jam nuts at each end. You have trim tabs on the two elevators. You want to grab these and make certain they're tight. Okay. They should be lined up equally with the elevator. Okay. What I'll do in the cockpit is set it for neutral trim and then verify that that's actually where it is. Okay. We have a rudder here. I'll make sure it moves left and right to the stops. Make sure the trim tab is secure. Okay. We do have lights on this, primarily strobe lights for recognition, although it is equipped for night flight. Uh, I'm not one yet to fly a Stearman at night. Okay. There's a big blue flame that comes out of that uh, exhaust stack over there on the right hand side. And uh, you can't see it during the daytime. And sometimes when we can't see things, it's, we're better with that. <laughs> at night, there's a big blue flame about 12 inches long coming back at you. Okay, come around this side, same thing. Check the flying wires. Uh, you want to make sure all the inspection panels are closed. An easy way on the steerman to tell that screws are actually locked is they're in line with the surface. Okay? So if you look at this, if you look at anywhere, there's a panel. It's in line with the surface, all the screws, so you can verify that everything is tight. More than one steerman has been lost because somebody left the panel open on takeoff. I actually had a very good friend lose a steerman, as a matter of fact, because of that. We have a baggage compartment here. You wanna make certain you've got your airworthiness certificate and your you know, required documents usually are in here, your registration, weight and balance, et cetera. Make sure everything's secured. Come around this side, just like the right side of the aircraft. We're gonna check the aileron, check the panels that they're closed, check the flying wires and the landing wires. 
I'll come around to each side and I'll just give it a good little cut. Anything loose will come around this side. This is your pitot tube. It does, it measures your airspeed. It's also the static source for this airplane. And that's what measures your height above the ground. Okay, so you wanna make certain the cover is off of this. Typically when we park outside, we'll put a cover on this uh, and you wanna take that off. Airplanes, you need, the, you need this open to take off and land so you can understand what your airspeed is. Come around this side. Again, there are panels here. Don't normally open these up on pre-flight. I didn't think, no, we probably could have had one open with the display. We've got an oil here. You'll check that for quantity. Uh, somewhere between three and a half to four gallons is what works in a Stearman. Come around here, check tires as we discussed. No leaks, either at the strut area down here or from the brakes on each side. I'll check down here, make sure we have no fluids coming out um, from the engine. And then we come around here to the front and you wanna check the engine that all the spark plugs are actually tight. No leaks, no fretting uh, uh, from cylinders, maybe not being tight against the crankcase. This is a constant speed propeller. So you wanna check the counterweights and make sure there are no leaks here as well. And then one of the things we'll do when we pull it outside, until the airplane goes by here, engine the name comes from all of the cylinders radiating out from the central crankcase okay. wonderful engine but one of the potential problems with the radial engine when it is shut down is for oil to drain from the upper cylinders and and the, the valleys and everything in there to the lower cylinders they can oil can actually accumulate between the piston and the top of the cylinder and hydraulic fluid as oil does not compress. So it's called a hydraulic lock. What you wanna do before you go fly is pull this propeller through two revolutions. I count seven cylinders when I do it. That way we know we pull it through each of the seven cylinders at once. And you can actually feel a hydraulic lock. It will come to a stop. If you were to hit that with your starter, you're gonna end up doing a lot of damage to this engine, okay? So you wanna pull it through all the time. We have uh, drains on each of these cylinders on this particular airplane. Some airplanes do not, and if you do catch a hydraulic lock, all you do is pull a spark plug out, the oil then drains, okay? And then uh, I would look up on top. Uh, we need fuel, okay? There's a fuel gauge that's right in front of the passenger, and the pilot can see it up there. Right now we're a little more than half fuel on that. We carry 46 gallons of fuel. You would think it, it, like, it's staring you right in the face, yet Stearmans have crashed running out of fuel. I, I don't get that one, okay? There are drains for, for uh, the tank at both the left side and the right side up there on top. There's also a drain for the fuel right here on the gascovator and, and, and the engine. I'll usually drain those only at the start of the day, uh, and if we add fuel then throughout the day, we'll, we'll check that, okay? There's an air intake on top up there. You want to make certain, you know, if it's sat for any length of time, nobody's got anything up there, put a cover on it, et cetera. That is your air intake. And, uh, and then, as I mentioned, when I walk around the airplane, I'll grab these and just, these are the, the broomsticks or javelins and make certain they're tight. Jeff, you have anything to add to that? That sounded like a fantastic pre-flight inspection to me. Okay. I guess let's go flying. Time to go flying. Huh? All right. I bet we have a Rosie around here. Might want to go. Take, uh, do we have any questions for them? Yeah, we sure do. Um, here's the first one. I think this was probably for Robin. The headscarves that the ladies are wearing, are they polka dot or wow headscarves? We have the polka dot ones on, uh, the Rosie the Riveter ones on. There is one for wow. It, it was an army issue for women working in the ordnance factory. It looks like a little bomb with a little sparkle, you know, behind it but these are actual these this was the design for women working in the ordnance factories we do have the polka dot all right we have another question seeing uh wing walkers at a U uk show do they have to modify the wing structure for wing walking that out? the wing structure you know I've, I've seen them put supports on them for the wing walker to actually hold on to a lot of times there's other mod modifications since it's generally done as part of an air show. They'll put a bigger engine on it. That Pratt & Whitney 450 engine that I mentioned before is a pretty popular option. Sometimes we'll even put another pair of ailerons on the top wing to give the airplane a little bit more roll rate. 
and uh, you know the wing walker will also have a place that they can sit at on the top of the center section. Um, no plans like that for our airplane. Uh, you know, we do no. want to uh, have our plane. No, no. 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 <laughs> we, we do want to have a rides program for our airplane. So when it is restored, we do want to make rides available to the public. Um, but no requirement for any wing walking or air show work. So we want to try to keep it as authentic as possible. Um, I actually want to ask Vic if he's aware of any other modifications that they've done for the wing walking. No, I'm not aware of any. I think you covered it pretty well. Okay. Uh, another one of the questions, I think you guys have addressed it somewhat, but what's it like to fly in a Stearman and how does it differ from other airplanes? I mean, I've characterized it as kind of like uh, riding a Harley, except you're a couple thousand feet in the air. Um, you know, there's definitely wind, um, but you're behind a, a, a canopy or a, a windshield, so it's not too bad. Um, the neat thing about it is, you know, if you're flying over a pasture that they've cut, it's, you can smell it. If you're flying over, you know, something you don't want to smell, sometimes you can smell that. <laughs> but uh, it, it's just a really neat experience. You feel like you're out in the, in the air, in the environment. And uh, for me, it's pretty relaxing. After a long week of work, you know, kind of getting up early on a Saturday morning with Don and uh, flying the airplane around for a little while is a good way to decompress. We, too, call it our Harley in the sky. And uh, sometimes that gets rid of a little bit of the trepidation for those who might be a little anxious on their first flight. I have to tell you, the Stearman is the first airplane, and probably the only airplane I've actually seen people. What I'll do is I'll fly down the interstate, sometimes on a nice day at 500 feet or so, and uh, try and put my shadow on cars. <laughs> and it, it's funny actually seeing sunroofs roll back and windows roll down and people wave me. Oh, okay, so I kind of really enjoy that. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Flying-wise, though, it can be a little bit challenging. Like I said before, it was a trainer. It's a trainer. It, was, it had into it designed some tendencies that uh, you, know, you don't find in modern trainers. You know, they try to make them as easy to fly as possible. They tried to make this one a little bit more challenging to fly. So uh, that very narrow landing gear, the very high center of gravity, the fact that it's a tailwheel airplane, um, a tailwheel airplane always wants to swap ends with you. Um, it's called a ground loop and uh, all Stearman pilots kind of live in fear of that, and you really have to stay on your toes to make sure that when the airplane is on the ground and rolling, that you're keeping it rolling straight, because if you get it just off center a little bit, it wants to swap ends with you completely. So, uh, so how about if I counter that just a little bit, Jeff? Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So I would tell you, you know, with almost a thousand hours in Stearman's and 20 some years and all kinds of conditions, uh, I think it's got an un undeserved reputation. I know it was called the yellow peril at times, mm -hmm. right, for some of the uh, descriptions there that Jeff mentioned, but it's, uh, you know, as pilots were all told, pay attention to that airplane till it's in the chalks. And I think that's the best advice to give somebody. You're just paying attention all the time. You don't let your mind drift. So the last thing I really want to do is, is really scare away anybody that thinks they might really want to fly a steer me. It's not that difficult. I would, I would tell you, a super pilot by any means. But our first steerman, very first steerman, we bought it in the morning. Okay. The instructor took me around the patch. We did three takeoff and landings, and I taught the rest of the partners how to fly it in the afternoon. Okay. <laughs> and so, you know, it's it, it just pay attention. It's it's uh and, and that's why it was a trainer. Okay. Uh it it it, it it taught everybody to pay attention, yet taught the necessary skills to be able to move up to other aircraft and go off and fight a war. Yeah, my instructor told me that it will really, really reward good technique, yes. but it will punish bad technique, which is an attribute that is desirable in a trainer. I think that's a fair, yes, I would agree with that. We have a couple more if we have time. Sure, we do. Uh, how do you join the Dixie Wing and how can I find out more about this project? Uh, I'll, I'll take that. So a couple of things. First of all, we encourage everybody who has an interest in either aviation or history or even inspiring future pilots and mechanics, join the Dixie Wing. Um, we actually have a website, uh, DixieWing.org, that will have all the information you need about this particular chapter. And then on top of that, we have a national organization based in Texas that also has a great deal of information about other chapters in case you can't get to us. But, uh, but the other piece is we're actually hosting a, uh, a new member information night on October 14th at 7 o'clock. It's a Zoom meeting. You'll find information on our website. So if you really have the itch, if you just really want to know what, it, what it's like to get involved, then join the website. Um, uh, go to the website, join the Zoom meeting, and we'll share with you all the information you need to know to become involved. Okay. The last question we have is, do you receive any contributions from the government or the military? 
and and are along that line, what donation levels will you have for this project? Uh, I'll take the first part. You have the second. Yeah. So today we're a hundred percent volunteer funded organization, which means uh, the members do their their contribution of time and their their talent. We're able to raise money to keep these aircraft flying, including this project. Uh, Jeff mentioned we got off to a very fast start in July, but we can also see that we're at a point where we could use some uh, some donations to help cover costs, for example, for an engine purchase. And our goal is to do it right, but we could definitely use your help. Um, Robin, you want to answer the second? Uh, the donation levels, we're still working that out at this time. Um, if you check our keep check of the specific website for the restoration, which is cafsteerman.org, at some point, hopefully in the next few months, we will have that outlined on our website as to exactly what our donation levels are. But we do have a currently have a donation button on that website. That link is currently active and available. All right. Should we go flying? Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. All right. We'll stay live while we get the airplane out on the ramp. I'll be talking to you guys because, as you can you can see from my. Uh, broadcast. We have quite a few airplanes here. As Chris Madrid mentioned, we have seven um, World War II aircraft. Actually, the T-34 right here, it's not uh, World War II era, but uh, it's considered a warbird. Right here, we have the mighty FG-1D Corsair. Um, Corsairs were built by Chance Vaught but Goodyear built them as well under uh, license. This one right here, it's a FG-1D Corsair. In fact, in the colors of the pilot Mo Shans, and uh, it's the famous uh, checkerboard VMF-312. And um, interesting fact about this aircraft uh, is that it was actually based at NAS Atlanta at Chambly. DeKalb um, Airport PDK for the pilots out there um, was based from 1952 uh, from 1950 until 1952 and uh, we are getting as I mentioned getting ready to uh, get the steerman out as you can see it's a fairly light aircraft but you got to really uh, make sure where you put your hands because it's all all fabric uh, our P-51 red nose uh, left this morning went to um, uh, Egling Air Force Base, uh, test pilot school, and we actually have a contract with the Air Force where we are actually flying uh, U.S. Air Force test pilots in the P-51. Uh, this is a uh, Kate, uh, replica Kate, Japanese bomber used in Baba, Black Sheep, Battle of Midways, and uh, Tora Tora Tora, the movies. Uh, it was originally built uh, on a B-13 uh, platform and uh, the Universal Studios converted into a Kate Bomber. Right here we have our P-63. Um, that, oh, well, uh, I might have to go real quick here because they're about to crank the engine. This is our P-63, which flew in 2017 after 16 years uh, restoration. We have our SBD down this year without an engine. The engine has been overall. And uh, that's it for now. We also have a T-6 back here. And now the best part, they are going to crank. Now, we were supposed to have a golf cart, but somebody took the golf cart, so we'll have to walk uh, all the way up to the taxiway. You excited, Robin? All right. Beautiful day. We had uh, quite a lot of rain the next in the last few days here in Atlanta, but. Uh, Today actually it's perfect, not too hot, not too humid, and uh, feels good, about probably 65 degrees, 66. You can see, uh, you can see our hangar here in the background. Uh, a few of the members came out, the museum is still closed, we are not allowing any 
any visitors and we are allowed a maximum of 25 members at a time, obviously due to uh, of COVID. Okay, brakes on. Mike is taking the chocks off. Hey, Chris, do you mind to drive the golf cart? Yep. Sorry, we were planning to have a golf cart and uh, follow the We're gonna use the golf cart to follow the plane. Where? Where are you from? me by the taxiway intersection thank you yeah yeah love it all right our finance officer uh, Pete Dallier here is uh, giving us a little tour Warming up, uh, warming up the engine, bring it up to temperature. All right, ready to go. We have two members here of our unit, Mike and Pete, and uh, I'd like to Pete to answer a question because there is a misconception that you got to be either a military pilot or a pilot to join the CAF. And uh, what do you do for a living? So people uh, know. Yeah, so I'm a corporate strategist for uh, a company called Invista, which is a nylon manufacturer owned by a larger conglomerate out of Wichita. Um, and so I've been in George. I've been a wing member for about three years. I joined when I was actually in business school, um, and now I just I work as a corporate strategist and, and the finance officer for the wing. He's the most important man here. He, he has the, the checkbook. I got the He's checkbook. The most That's right. Man, and there you go. And then we have Mike, who is a professional pilot for uh, for Spirit later, right? What's that? Spirit. Tell, tell us about your experience and now you joined the Dixie Wing. Yeah, joined the Dixie Wing. Uh, I had been flying regional airlines forever and then wanted to get back into general aviation and started hanging around the, the Command of Air Force in the Dixie Wing. I don't think so. Okay. Started flying with the PT-19 and then uh, worked up to the T-6. And, so, and question for you. Everyone is usually asked, how, how do I get to fly the CF Warbirds? How does it work? Well, I think it varies from unit to unit, wing to wing, but essentially if you show that you're dedicated to the unit and you're going to you're um, obviously you're not going to be dedicated if you're not interested so if you got a high interest level that leads to productivity and lots of helping out at the uh, different functions and whatnot uh, and obviously we're a bigger unit here we have a lot more going on so it's a lot easier to find things to do and then you just start tickling the right ears and uh, opportunities come up and uh, you know in my 
circumstance, I was a volunteer for 12 months before I decided or got asked to fly an airplane. So it varies, but uh, there is a need for pilots, mechanics, especially mechanics, and as well as other every other skill set that's that's out Since there. Since we have the money man and the pilot, how does the sponsorship of each aircraft work? Sure. You want to say you want me to? Uh, you go ahead and take it. Then. So the aircraft for the CAF are all owned by the Commemorative Air Force uh, corporate organization in Dallas, Texas, and is assigned to each wing. When somebody has expressed an interest in flying and the, and the wing agrees that uh, we want to take somebody on as a pilot, what we typically do is we'll put you through something called the Flight Evaluation Board, and that's where we, we look at your logbook, we make sure you're a good culture fit, that you're a safety conscious uh, individual, and then what we'll have you do is uh, go to your FEB. At that point, you'll be asked to sponsor the airplane, which is uh, you sign a small donation that the amount varies depending on the aircraft. Uh, that goes to the corporate headquarters, and then we begin your training regimen. Is that pretty much your experience? Yeah, that's, that's correct. And the uh, initial sponsorship fee, it's a lifetime sponsorship fee. It's, it's with you and the airplane forever. It's not like a recurring thing. It is tax deductible because you're a nonprofit organization. Uh, and it's actually a pretty uh, nominal amount when it considers you, if you're a pilot or a mechanic, what it, especially pilots, what it, what it gets you the opportunity to fly these priceless warbirds. Uh, you don't have to sponsor as a mechanic. That's right. It used to be. That's just back to, in the old just day. to fly. Yeah, yeah. Clarify. Yeah, no more mechanics do not have to be sponsored. Just awesome. To fly All right, guys, thanks for your time. The steerman is about to take off, so we'll shift the attention to. All right, you, if you look at this in between the wind socks, you'll, you'll see the airplane. I'll try to zoom in. Obviously, the quality, it's what it is, guys, but I think you can get the idea. Airplane's in the center of the runway. Keep an eye on it because Vic has a little surprise for us. Here he goes. Full power. Tail is up. wheels off and listen to this beautiful noise or music for some the smoke thanks big All right, all good things have to come to an end, right, Chris? Yes, yes Bill. Thank you very much for everyone to join us today. Uh, we hope you enjoyed learning about the steering. We hope you also learned a lot about what we're trying to do to keep all these aircraft alive. Uh, if I could leave you with one thought, uh, the Commander Air Force is a 100% volunteer organization. We restore and fly World War II aircraft as, uh, as a thank you to all our veterans and to the nation. But most importantly, we're also trying to help inspire future pilots, mechanics, and citizens. So. Keep them flying. Look forward to seeing you next time.